Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to a quick angry bulletin today. I have returned to the United Kingdom thanks to you folks. Thanks to generous people like Michael Fireberg or Joseph Pistrito, Fraser McIntyre, Paul Wrightson, Barry McMillan, Jorge Cosma Rivera, and also people who supported me on Patreon. That includes my newest members, such as Steve. Steve Karen or Greg Man to AI, Stephen Fernandes, Stephen Higley. All of these folks have contributed to getting me back to the UK and making my trip to the United States possible. Overall, covered about 90% of my expenses. Really fantastic. I appreciate it. If you would like to help me get over that last 10%, that's up to you. Details in the description. But the best way is just to support me on Patreon because once I hit that 1% threshold I keep talking about, I'll never have to do a another fundraiser again. There will be no need for it. Okay, enough talk about that. Let's talk about what you're watching right now. That is to say, a probe landing on Mars. Either the Perseverance or the Curiosity, both of them essentially landed on Mars this way, and it took a lot of effort to try to get these probes on the surface because of Mars' thin atmosphere. They needed a sky crane. They couldn't rely entirely on parachutes, braking thrusters, or anything else, and these probes are a mere one metric ton. So how can we expect to land something as massive as Starship, 100 tons worth of stainless steel and 100 tons worth of payload at least, plus all the propellant and oxidizer that's going to be on board in order to perform the braking maneuvers. For years, this has seemed to be a bit of an impossible task, or at least an extremely dangerous one. I've made several videos about the topic, which I tend to define as the Starship suicide dive, but it appears that SpaceX and NASA have been quietly working for years on a new technique to put heavy payloads on the Martian surface. Not only does it look very promising, we actually know that it's probably going to work. It's going to require a different approach than Elon Musk has been talking about for years, but at the same time, it is very feasible. And NASA and SpaceX have been quietly practicing this process for years. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. During the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from an article entitled The New Mars Landing Approach, How We'll Land Large Payloads on the Red Planet. As all of us know, Elon Musk intends to send hundreds of starships, probably thousands actually, to Mars, bringing not only colonists, but also all of the necessary structural materials, supplies, food, everything that is necessary to keep a colony alive long enough for it to become self-sustaining in the future. But in spite of the fact that it would appear that getting there is the main problem, one of the biggest problems aside from this is the process of landing on the red planet. It is one of the most difficult and dangerous things that we can do in the solar system because it is fundamentally different than the moon and fundamentally different from landing on Earth. On the moon, all you need is a propulsive landing, something that can be calculated fairly accurately simply because you have no atmosphere interfering with your landing process. On Earth, you have an extremely thick atmosphere that bleeds off lots and lots of velocity, making the landing a lot less challenging once you finally have to apply braking thrust. On Mars, things are completely different. Because the atmosphere is less than 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere, terminal velocity is un unbelievably high on Mars. A thousand kilometers per hour or quadruple the terminal velocity on Earth, meaning that bleeding off speed using the atmosphere is not enough. 
And both NASA, the European Space Agency, and especially the Russians have discovered this challenge over and over again as they have smashed spacecraft after spacecraft into the surface of the Red Planet without a great deal of success until recently. So, according to this article, and by the way, it was written by an individual at Universe Today, and he interviewed a man named Rob Manning, who is a senior engineer at the Jet Propulsion laboratory, Manning had this to say way back in 2007. Quote, many people immediately conclude that landing humans on Mars should be easy since we've landed successfully on the moon and we routinely land human carrying vehicles from space to Earth. And since Mars falls between the Earth and the moon in size and in the amount of atmosphere, then the middle ground of Mars should be easy. But Mars' atmosphere provides challenges not found on the Earth or the Moon. A large, heavy spacecraft streaking through Mars' atmosphere has only a few minutes to slow from incoming interplanetary speeds. For example, the Perseverance rover is traveling at 19,500 kilometers per hour when it reached Mars to under Mach 1, and then quickly transition to a lander that's slow enough that should be able to touch down gently. In 2007, the prevailing notion amongst JPL engineers was that there is too little atmosphere to land like we do on Earth, and there is actually too much atmosphere on Mars to land heavy vehicles like we do on the Moon by using propulsive technology alone. Quote, we call it the supersonic transition problem, said Manning. Unique to Mars, there is a velocity altitude gap below Mach 5. The gap is between the delivery capability of large entry systems of Mars and the capability of super and subsonic decelerator technologies to get below the speed of sound. The largest payload that we've ever landed on Mars so far is the Perseverance, as I said before, weighing only about one metric ton. So how do we land something that weighs 200 times this? Well, Manning in 2024 had something new to say, quote, so how do you slow down to subsonic speeds to get to speeds where traditionally we know how to fire our engines to enable touchdown? We thought bigger parachutes or subsonic decelerators like the lofted, which has already been tested by NASA, would allow us to maybe slow down better, but there were still issues with both of these devices. But there was one trick we didn't know anything about. How about using your propulsion system and firing the engines backwards, retro propulsion, while you were flying at supersonic speeds to shed velocity? Back in 2007, we didn't know the answer to that. We didn't even think that it was possible. When you fire the engines backwards, as you are moving through an atmosphere, there is a shock front that forms and it would be moving around, says Manning. So it could come along and whack the vehicle and cause it to go unstable or cause damage. You're also flying right into the plume of the rocket engine exhaust, so there could be extra friction and heating possibilities on the vehicle. Now, all of these factors are very hard to simulate and model, and there was no experience of doing it back in 2007 because no one had ever used propulsion of technology alone to slow and then land a spacecraft on Earth. This is because the atmosphere slows the spacecraft down easily, especially the parachute or creative flying as the space shuttle did. So how do you get the necessary experience? Well, I think you can guess based on the footage you're watching, but we'll get there in just a moment. Quote, people did study it a bit and we came to the conclusion that it would be great to try it and find out whether we could fire the engines backwards and see what happens. But there wasn't extra funding lying around to launch a rocket just to watch it come back down and see what happens. Happened. But of course, SpaceX wanted to do precisely this with Falcon 9. Quote, SpaceX said that they were going to try it. And to do that, they needed to slow the booster down in the supersonic phase while in Earth's upper atmosphere. So there's a portion of the flight where they fire their engines backwards at supersonic speeds through a thin atmosphere, which is very much like 
what happens on Mars. So obviously, this was extremely interesting to JPL. As we all know, on September 29, 2013, SpaceX performed the first supersonic retro propulsion or SRP maneuver to decelerate the entry of the first stage of their Falcon 9 rocket. It hit the ocean and was destroyed, but the SRP worked. And so NASA, keenly interested, asked if their engineers could watch and study SpaceX's data, and SpaceX readily agreed. Beginning in 2014, NASA and SpaceX formed a three-year public-private partnership centered on SRP data analysis called the NASA Propulsive Descent Technology Project. The Falcon 9 boosters were outfitted with special instruments to collect data specifically on portions of the entry burn which fell within the range of Mach numbers and dynamic pressures expected at Mars. Additionally, there were visual and infrared imagery campaigns, flight reconstruction, and fluid dynamics analysis, all of which helped both NASA and SpaceX. And of course, as we all know, on December 21st, 2015, a Falcon 9 first stage returned and successfully landed on landing zone one at Cape Canaveral for the first time ever. Quote, based on the analyses completed, the remaining SRP challenge is characterized as one of prudent flight systems engineering dependent on maturation of specific Mars flight systems, not technology advancement, according to an engineering team from NASA. What does that mean? Well, it just means that technologically, this can be done. There's no longer a challenge here. It's just a matter of making the rockets mature enough to to utilize this type of braking maneuver. Quote, it turns out we learned some new physics, said Manning. They found that the shock front bubble created around the vehicle by firing the engines somehow insulates the spacecraft from buffeting as well as from some of the heating. Engineers now believe that SRP is the only Mars entry, descent, and landing technology that is scalable across a wide range and size of missions to shed enough velocity during atmospheric flight to enable safe landings. Alongside aerobraking, this is one of the leading means of landing heavy equipment, habitats, and of course, humans on Mars. But of course, there are lots of significant issues that remain unsolved when it comes to landing a starship on Mars. Manning mentioned that there are multiple unknowns, including how a big ship such as SpaceX's Starship would be steered and flown through Mars' atmosphere because the fins might not work in an atmosphere like Mars and not hypersonically. Would the plasma thermal environment become a problem? Also, the amount of debris kicked up by large engines on human-sized ships could be fatal, especially for the engines that you'd like to reuse for returning to orbit or to Earth. So how do you protect the engines and the ship? Mars can also be quite windy, so what happens when you encounter wind shears or a dust storm? That could be a real problem. The thermal heating could go up drastically if the atmosphere was full of dust. What kind of landing legs will work for a large strip on Mars' rocky surface. Then there are logistics problems, such as how will you get the infrastructure established, like landing pads, for example? How will ships be refueled to return home? This is all going to take a lot of time. More than most people realize, according to Manning, and by the way, I agree with him, one of the downsides of going to Mars is that it's going to be hard to do trial and error unless you're very patient, because the next time you get an opportunity, if your first attempt fails, is 26 months later because of the timing of the launch windows between our two planets. That's going to be a real pain for SpaceX's iterative process, but we are going to learn a lot whenever we try it for the first time. And at least the supersonic retropropulsion question has been answered. Manning wrapped up the article with an interesting quote. We're basically doing what Buck Rogers told us to do in the 1930s. Fire your engines backwards while you're going really fast. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. All the details are in the description. And as always, stay angry about space.